Cold War and the Fair Deal, 1945 to 1952. The political and economic confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States that dominated world affairs from 1946 to about 1989. At the end of this unit of the study of the Cold War and the Fair Deal, American U.S. history students should be able to answer these focused questions. Why and how did the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union develop? Two, what was the impact of U.S. efforts to contain the Soviet Union and the growth of global communism during Harry Truman's presidency? Three, how did Truman expand the New Deal? How effective was his Fair Deal agenda? Four, what were the major international developments during 1949-1950 and how did they alter U.S. foreign policy? And five, how did the Red Scare emerge? How did it impact American politics and society? Truman and the Cold War During World War II, as the Red Army swept westward toward Berlin, it would retake the land from the Nazis and install puppet governments in their place. While this violated a signed agreement, the Russians did not see it as a violation, but rather as self-defense. When Truman inherited the presidency, he was placed into a crumbling alliance with the Soviet Union. Winston Churchill would use the term Iron Curtain to describe the differences between the Soviet-controlled portions of Eastern Europe and more American and British-influenced portions in Western Europe. As Churchill would say, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie the capitals, the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Churchill and Truman both wanted to undermine communism in Eastern Europe and to promote democratic governments within these nations. But the Soviet Union wanted the opposite. It became increasingly obvious to Truman and the United States that Stalin and the USSR were willing to break agreements in their efforts to promote communism and their own power in Europe and Asia. In Poland, the leaders and intellectuals who fought against Nazis and were in favor of democracy during the occupation were now rounded up and massacred by the communists. Post-war planning for Germany included Soviet demands for large-scale reparations. The Containment Policy To prevent Russia expansion in Europe and Asia, U.S. diplomat George F. Keenan argued that the U.S. policy must be one of containing the Russians where they already were. In Keenan's famous long telegram of 5,000 words from February 22, 1946, he predicted that the Soviets would never embrace a permanent happy coexistence of the socialist and capitalist worlds. Instead of continuing to rely on personal diplomacy, as had FDR, Keenan recommended the United States pursue a policy of containment. Due to Russia was not historically expansive, marxist leninist doctrines were now motivating the Russians. The Soviets would seek to influence neighborhoods states to adopt communism, and the USSR would exercise a persistent pressure, but would withdraw if opposed. The United States must assert firm, vigilant containment, patiently over the long term if needed. Containment was viewed as a defensive measure against a ruthless adversary. Secretary of State George C. Marshall agreed with Keenan's analysis, but sought a political approach to containment, whereas Keenan focused on military solutions. The Truman Doctrine The first major East-West confrontation in December of 1945 began in the Middle East. An Anglo-Soviet agreement in 1941 allowed the stationing of British forces in southern Iran and Soviet troops in northern Iran. Although the agreement specified that forces would be withdrawn at war's end, Soviet troops remained, aiding separatist revolts in northern Iran, as Azerbaijan, and Kurdistan. The Soviets refused to withdraw after the March 2nd deadline and blocked Iran's attempt to end the rebellion. By May 4th, however, the Iranian government and the Soviets had reached an agreement which made the Soviet withdrawal complete. 
This confrontation caused the United States to consider assuming a greater role in the Middle East. Turkey was threatened by an external Soviet-backed movement seeking to control the Dardanelles Straits during 1945. The USSR pressured Turkey and demanded a cession of several Turkish districts on the Soviet-Turkish frontier, a reversion of the 1936 Montreal Convention, giving Turkey exclusive supervision of the Dardanelles and a leasing to the USSR of naval and land bases in the Strait, giving joint defense to Turkey and the Soviets. Warnings from Truman that the U.S. would support the United Nations with military power to protect Near Eastern nations Official protests by the United States rejected Soviet demands and the U.S. naval movements in the Mediterranean caused the Soviets to ease its pressure in late 1946. Greece was threatened by a Soviet-backed internal guerrilla movement seeking to overthrow the government. In August 1946, communist-led rebellion against the newly elected right-wing government broke out continuing the Civil War, which broke out when German occupation ended. Guerrilla forces were supported and given sanctuary from the neighboring communist states of Albania, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia. It was due to Greece in which the Truman Doctrine was first used. After Britain announced that it could no longer provide economic military aid to Turkey and Greece after March 31, 1947, Truman requested before a joint session of Congress that the United States provide the necessary aid. Truman's request for aid became known as the Truman Doctrine, an open-ended commitment to use U.S. power anywhere and any time to oppose the threat of Soviet communism, wherever it was perceived. Quote, it must be U.S. policy to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressure. End quote. Congress, with Republican majorities in both houses, approved $400 million in aid. Soviets withdrew support from attempts to overthrow Turkish and Greek governments, making it appear that containment successfully countered communist aggression. The Marshall Plan George Marshall, new Secretary of State of Truman, introduced a plan to provide aid to any European nation that requested it. Although they originally were included, the Russian delegation was ordered to withdraw from the imperialistic scheme. The Marshall Plan, which distributed aid throughout Europe, is represented in this 1949 cartoon as a modern tractor driven by a prosperous farmer. In the foreground, a poor overworked and it is yoked to the old-fashioned Soviet plow, forced to go over the ground of the Marshall-Stalin Plan. While Stalin himself tries to persuade others that it's the same thing without the mechanical problems. Post war Europe was devastated by the war, and Truman believed that communism operated best among political chaos and economic deprivation. Post war Europe emerged as the Cold War key arena. Secretary of State George Marshall's speech at Harvard University launched the Marshall Plan. The United States was not directing its efforts against any specific nation or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. The purpose was to revive a working economy in the world so as to permit the emergence of political and social conditions in which free institutions can exist. In April 1948, the Republican-dominated Congress approved $5.3 billion in aid for a one-year European recovery program, which also included $275 million more for Turkey and Greece. Foreign ministers of Britain, France, and the Soviet Union met to consider the offer, but Soviet foreign ministers saw it as the United States' imperialist plot to enslave Europe. Britain and France invited 22 nations to join a committee for economic cooperation to draft plans for the reconstruction of Europe using United States aid after the Soviet and Eastern European Communist Bloc nations declined to attend, 16 nations met in Paris from July 12th to September 22nd, 1947. The Mutual Security Act of 1951 provided $7 billion in additional foreign aid.
What you see before you is two photographs of a street in Hamburg. The one on the left was before the Marshall Plan. The one on the right was after the Marshall Plan. Divided Germany. In 1948, France, England, and the United States united their zones of occupation in Germany as part of their efforts to rebuild the nation. They then organized a newly democratic elected government. The Russians, the only communist member of the Allies, resented this action and began to restrict road and rail access to West Berlin. The four occupying powers disagreed over the government for post-war Germany, a centralized form favored by the Soviets, versus a federal form of government favored by Britain and the United States. The Soviets also requested for $10 billion in reparations, was rejected, and discussions broke down. The Western powers continued talks without the Soviets. On March 30th, 1948, after withdrawing its representatives from the Allied Control Council in Berlin on March 28th, the Soviets refused to allow the United States, British, or French troop trains to travel to Berlin without their inspection and closed off ground transportation to Berlin. On June 7, 1948, Western powers created a federal zone from the Western German occupied zones forming the Federal Republic of Germany, that would also be known as West Germany. A Soviet blockade was then enforced on West Berlin, and for months the only way that its citizens received food, coal or medicine was via a massive American airlift of goods. The Berlin Airlift, June 24, 1948 to May 25, 1949. After the Soviet Union discontinued all land traffic between Berlin and West Germany, the West airlifted supplies between West Germany and 2.1 million Berlin residents. The airlift lasted 321 days before the Soviet ban was finally lifted, having failed to alter U.S. policy towards Germany. In May of 1949, the German Democratic Republic, East Germany, was formed. It again appeared that the containment policy was indeed working. Forming Alliance A girl gives Gram her grandmother a kiss through the barbed wire fence that has divided the Dutch and German border in 1947. On April 4, 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty was signed, creating the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, which pledged that an attack against one member was an attack against all and would be responded to as such. NATO solidified ties between the United States and its Western European allies. In 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was founded as a mutual defense pact. Belgium, Denmark, France, Great Britain, Luxembourg, Portugal, Italy, Iceland, Netherlands, and Norway. These 12 nations in Washington, D.C. signed a military alliance called NATO. The Brussels Pact signatories, plus the United States, plus Canada, Denmark, Iceland, Italy, Norway, and Portugal, was signed on July 21, 1949. With its passage, the U.S. Senate, 82 to 13, accepted collective security, a concept rejected after World War I. But it was Article 5 that specifically stated that attacking one member would be perceived as attacking on all of them. This has only been used once in the history of NATO when President George W. Bush called on it after 9-11 for Afghanistan. The Mutual Defense Assistance Act of September 21, 1949 provided military aid to NATO allies. The Soviet Union responded by creating the Warsaw Pact, a military alliance of the Soviet Union and communist nations of Eastern Europe from 1959 till it ended in 1989. In the late 1940s and 50s, the Cold War split Europe into rigidly divided Western and Eastern blocs. Members of NATO allied with the United States to oppose Soviet expansion, and the Soviet Union directed the military and foreign policy of members of the Warsaw Pact. Reorganizing the military. 
the National Security Act of 1947 on July 26 by combining the Departments of War and the Department of Navy. It elevated the Air Force to a third major military branch. By reorganizing the U.S. Armed Forces and intelligence agency under one Secretary of Defense in the Cabinet was the hope to create a better efficiency. James Forrestal, the former Secretary of the Navy, was the first Secretary of Defense. The Joint Chiefs of Staff oversaw the three main branches of the military, Army, Navy, and Air Force, to coordinate military activities. The National Security Council, the NSC, was established to provide a group of top international relations specialists to advise the President. The Act also formed the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, to coordinate global intelligence gathering for the United States. A year later, it received permission to protect American interests abroad using covert operations. It was denied activities involving internal security. Rear Admiral Roscoe Hoenkoiter was the first CIA director. A Jewish nation, Israel. Palestine had been under the Ottoman rule until the dissolution of the empire following World War I, making it a British protectorate. Britain announced that effective May 14, 1948, they would no longer maintain the mandate over Palestine, which they had since the ending of World War I, and returning its care to the United Nations. The UN General Assembly, under United States influence, voted to partition Palestine into separate Jewish and Arab states. Israel declared its independence on May 15th and was immediately recognized by the United States, the first nation to do so. Rejecting the partition of Palestine, the Arab states refused to recognize Israel's right to exist and went to war with Israel, a war that ended with the United Nations armistice. The Tripartite Declaration of May 25, 1950, deploring the Middle Eastern arms buildup, U.S., Britain, and France agreed to halt all violations of the armistice by either Israel or the Arabs by pledging not to contribute significantly to the arms race themselves. Continued U.S. support for Israel remained an irritant between the Arab states and the United States. Expanding the New Deal. Harry Truman had been added to the Democratic ticket in 1944 when FDR ran for his fourth term. He is virtually unknown in the Senate when he was chosen to be the Democratic vice presidential candidate. When he came into the presidency, he replaced many of FDR's cabinet members while favoring memory of the New Deal programs. From war to peace, the surrender of Japan took the United States by surprise. Plans for gradual reconversion were scrapped. The Pentagon canceled 15 billion war contracts two days after the Japanese surrendered. In 1947, the military had shrunk from 12 million soldiers to 1.5 million soldiers. This placed many veterans in need of education, employment, and housing. Wages, prices, and labor unrest. During the war, prices had been frozen to prevent gouging. Now, with the war over, the government released control on the economy and prices skyrocketed. When wages were not raised to compensate several unions, we go on strike. And for the most part, Truman's administration was successful in combating the strikes. But after the 1946 congressional elections, Truman gave up the battle. The Council of Economic Advisors Following the war, Congress established the Council of Economic Advisors, which was charged with advising the president on the economic health of the nation, which increased the role of the federal government in the nation's economy. Political Cooperation and Conflict The Servicemen's Adjustment Act of 1944, or GI Bill, was one of the federal government's most successful public assistance programs. Actually, it was the most successful public assistance programs. It guaranteed loans for buying a house, a farm, or starting a business. It also provided money for college, tuition, books, and a monthly stipend. In 1947, veterans made up half of all the college students. In 
Most GIs would actually use the money for trade schools, such as plumbing, electric, electrician, or carpentry. The Employment Act of 1946 helped define post-war economic growth. An attempt to ward off a possible economic crisis was a liberal effort that proposed economic growth and high employment as a national goal. The Taft-Harley Act of 1947. In 1946, Republicans took control of Congress and passed the Taft-Harley Labor Act that banned closed shops and blocked secondary boycotts. It also allowed for union shops where they were permitted by state law. Truman vetoed the bill, but his veto was overturned. Assembly line neighborhoods. One immediate problem in the first few years of the war was the severe housing shortage was met by government and private action. The Veterans Administration was a mortgage program that allowed veterans to get private loans for houses without a down payment. The Federal Housing Authority, or the FHA, financed nearly 40% of all home mortgages debt between 1946 and 1950. Builders created huge suburban housing developments of similar homes that were built in assembly line fashion in brief periods of time. Levittown was the innovative housing project for veterans that developed on the suburban Long Island, New York which boomed to more than 17,000 homes between 1947 and 1951. Levittown represented a change toward affordable homes in American suburbs. However, there was a northern form of segregation. African Americans were excluded from the new housing tracts and segregated in deteriorating urban ghettos. Civil Rights in the 1940s. Following the end of World War II, civil rights activists were able to draw on the horrors of the state-sponsored discrimination of Germany, Japan, and Italy to make companies to American problems of the waves. The issue of housing stimulated civil rights activism among African Americans. The NAACP and other groups campaigned for racial justice. In 1948, Truman banned racial discrimination in the hiring of federal employees. Then he integrated the armed forces by executive order. The top brass was against this, saying they didn't want a social experiment. But Truman also understood the military, after being in it as well, that it would work. Because after all, soldiers have to follow orders. Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson enrolled at UCLA, where he became the school's first athlete to win varsity letters in four sports, baseball, basketball, football, and track. He joined the United States Army after Pearl Harbor, and an event on July 6, 1944, almost destroyed his military career. Robinson was a U.S. Army officer and boarded an Army bus with a fellow officer's wife and refused to move to the back of the bus. Segregated sitting on buses was legal in Texas, but not on federal part, property, which Camp Hood was. Robinson was court-martialed in August of 1944, and due to this, missed going overseas with his unit to fight in Germany. But he was acquitted by an all-white panel of nine white officers. Branch Rickey was the club president and general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he interviewed Robinson and was especially interested in making sure his eventual signee could withstand the inevitable racial abuse that would be directed at him. In a famous three-hour exchange on August 28, 1945, Rickey asked Robinson if he could face the racial attacks without fighting back and taking it. Robinson was, of course, aghast. He said, are you looking for a Negro who's afraid to fight back? Ricky replied that he needed a Negro player with guts enough not to fight back. In his first year, Robinson did face racism on his own team until they were threatened by manager Leo DeRocha. The continuous racist remarks by other players on opposing teams unified the Brooklyn club. His culminative performance earned him the inaugural Major League Baseball's Rookie of the Year Award. His legacy. In 
Robinson would go on to lead the Dodgers to the champion of 1955 World Series. He was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1962. When he was up for the induction, he said, please, if you're considering me to put me in the Hall of Fame, do it due to my accomplishments, not the color of my skin for breaking the color barrier. His number 42 was officially retired by Major League Baseball in 1997. Mexican Americans and Civil Rights. There were segregated schools in Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and California. They would not allow Mexican American kids to be intermingled with white kids. Veterans returning from World War II were denied equal access to educational, medical, and housing benefits if they were of Mexican origin. Dr. Hector Perez Garcia, a United States Army surgeon with the rank of major, organized the GI Forum, initially focused on veterans issues, but also lobbied for the end of the poll tax, the right of for Latinos to serve on juries, and developed schools for the jobless vets. In 1984, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Shaping the New Deal. By 1947, Truman was facing criticism that he was not up for the job. Truman feared that General Douglas MacArthur was going to run on the Republican ticket in 1948 and offered himself as Vice President to General Eisenhower if he ran as a Democrat. Ike refused since he was going to be the new president of Columbia University in New York. But the Democrats were divided. Southern Democrats were upset of Truman's outspoken support of civil rights, and the left wing was angry over his firing of Henry Wallace and his Secretary of Commerce for criticizing Truman's anti-Soviet policies and blaming Truman for the Cold War. In a State of the Union address, Truman introduced his fair deal, which consisted of civil rights for everyone, increase federal aid to education, expand unemployment and retirement benefits, national health insurance, more electricity for rural areas, and increase the minimum wage. The election in 1948. Republicans nominated Thomas E. Dewey, the ex-governor, who was defeated in 1944, was chosen and Governor Earl Warren of California for vice president. Sensing the badly split Democrats, Republicans smelled victory. Truman pursued a moderate political strategy aimed at the vital center. The package, a commitment to maintaining the New Deal reforms, linked anti-communism and a foreign policy with efforts to enact inclusive social and economic policies to extend freedom abroad and at home, but attempts to maintain the party's popularity with labor. Henry Wallace, was the third party presidential candidate, believed that the U.S. foreign policy was instigating the Cold War. Dixiecrats, or the state's rights party, was led by Strom Thurmond, and they left the Democratic Party because their opposition to civil rights reforms raised by party members. Southern Democrats who broke from the party in 1948 over the issue of civil rights and ran in presidential tickets as the state rights Democrats. The 1948 party's convention were broadcast on television for the first time. The campaign. Unfortunately, Republicans, major newspapers endorsed Dewey, whose low-key style campaign cautiously avoided the issues and really said nothing. He was told, basically, the election's in the bag. You got it. Truman, on the other hand, crisscrossed the nation, stressing character and issues in his whistle stops, in which he talked directly to the American public. His consistent attacks on what he termed the do-nothing Republican Congress, and crowds yelling the slogan, give him hell, Harry, in which Truman responded, I don't give him hell. I just tell him the truth, and the Republicans think they are in hell. Truman won a narrow victory in the presidential election in 1948 by holding many of the traditional Democratic states on the South and the West and by winning key industrial states in the Midwest. His success depended on the coalition of rural and urban interests that Franklin Roosevelt had pulled together in the 1930s. He positioned himself as a moderate when compared to extreme third party candidates. The Republican candidate, Thomas Duty, became overconfident and distant from the voters, 
little experts and convinced him that it was in the bag. The no-nonsense personality of Truman allowed him to be appealing to the common voter. A fair deal. Hoping to build on the gains of the New Deal, Truman called for the fair deal for all Americans. The fair deal proposals were largely extensions of New Deal programs. Bipartisan coalitions of Southern Democrats and Republicans who had posed FDR's extension of the federal authority and spending in the 1930s undermined Truman's programs. Congress did respond by expanding existing programs, and he did achieve some of his objectives. The Housing Act of 1949 provided 800,000 units for the poor. The Social Security Act of 1950 expanded those covered by the system. The minimum wage was raised to 75 cents an hour. The Cold War heats up. After World War II, the U.S. aided the nationalists led by Chiang Kai-shek, who controlled the South against a communist in the North led by Mao Zedong. By 1947, the U.S. under Truman was reluctant to aid fully the nationalists without a comprehensive nationalistic plan for moral, political, and economic reforms. In August of 1949, the State Department White Paper determined that in order to save the nationalists from collapse, the United States would have to intervene militarily because of military, political, and economic deficiency with Chiang's regime. On December 8, 1949, nationalists fled mainland China to the island of Formosa, which is also known as Taiwan. The battleground shifted to the UN over who was the legitimate representative of China the Nationalist Chinese, or the People's Republic of China, the Communists. In August of 1950, the Soviet delegate to the UN Security Council boycotted the meeting over the presence of the Nationalists in the UN instead of the Communist China. While some nations, Britain and France, recognized Communist China, the US refused to recognize its legitimacy, supporting Nationalists on Formosa as legal representatives of China opposed changing China's UN delegation, but refused to commit forces to Formosa's defense in the 1950s. The results of the communist victory in China, including members of the State Department, were often unjustly accused of weakness. Critics accused the United States of placing too much emphasis on European allies, and the Foreign Service officers had correctly identified the weakness of Chinese nationalists. In Vietnam, the United States would try to bolster their alliance by supporting the French, who had colonies there opposing communist forces of Ho Chi Minh. Atomic Weapons The Atomic Energy Commission was established in 1946 to oversee research on atomic power and weapons testing. On September 23, 1949, the USSR explodes their first atomic bomb. Experts say it would take three to five years and the arms race begins. And in 1952, the United States exploded a hydrogen bomb. In the early 1950s, nuclear weapons proliferated. Great Britain would become the third nuclear world power. And the nuclear arms race and the fear of nuclear war raised the fears of the Cold War. New environmental and health problems emerged because of nuclear testing. Both the United States and the USSR developed the enormously powerful hydrogen bombs, and the rivalry between the United States and the USSR produced the beginning of a long arms race. What you see pictured there is a cutout of a bomb shelter that became very popular to have built in your backyard or underneath your yard. NSC 68. Truman's request to the NSC to assess the U.S.'s ability to contain communism resulted in NSC No. 68, a top-secret report that endorsed containment and called for a massive military buildup. NSC 68, the upheaval of 1949, led the State Department to issue National Security Council Paper 68 that saw that the world divided between freedom and slavery. The Soviet Union was painted as aggressor, and motivated by its desire for territory and in a fanatic faith in communism. It advised the United States to use as much force as possible to resist communist expansion. The National Security Council also recommended increasing U.S. defense spending by four times 
as much initially ignored but was resurrected by the Korean crisis when Truman recommended raising the armed forces to 3.5 million men and spending 13% of the GNP, $50 billion, annually on the defense. A military solution should be encouraged and to also contain communism. The long-range effects of NSC 60A included its emphasis on military action contributed to American involvement in Vietnam. It caused large-scale military spending by both the United States and the Soviet Union, and it served as the foundation of a greater deal of American foreign policy throughout the 1980s. War in Korea After World War II, Japan lost its claim to the Korean Peninsula which it had occupied since 1910. The Allies tried to establish a new government there, but the act was hindered by Soviet forces, which had advanced into Korea and defeated the Japanese forces in the northern section. Much like the German situation, the Allies agreed to divide the nation at the 38th parallel. On each side of the border, separate governments were created, resembling the supporting nations. The United States organized the Republic of Korea known as South Korea, under the democratically elected Syngman Rhee as the first president, and was organized under the UN flag with the capital at Seoul. But it was not recognized by the North. The South attracted some two million North Koreans by the end of 1948, when the United States and Soviet forces left the peninsula, leaving their two respected governments in place. The Democratic People Republic of Korea, known as North Korea, had a Soviet-organized communist government that quickly became a totalitarian regime under one family's rule under Kim Il-sung. On June 25, 1950, North Korea soldiers attacked South Korea. They had the support and supplies of both the USSR and Communist China. Truman sent in forces on the auspices of UN support, fearing that a request of the declaration of war by Congress would take too long. The UN Security Council censored North Korea's breach of peace without the veto of the Soviet delegate only because the USSR was boycotting the Council's refusal to seat the Communist Chinese delegate in the place of the National Chinese delegate. With the UN support, the United States heated a coalition commanded by General Douglas MacArthur and the UN's first authorized military action. The war, or so-called police action, became mired in Pusan in the southeastern South Korea until MacArthur sent an amphibious landing to Incheon on September 15th, the port city that leads to Seoul. UN troops recaptured Seoul on September 26th and then cut off the North Korean army and gave the UN troops more momentum. On October 7th, the UN General Council authorized UN forces to pursue North Koreans beyond the 38th parallel, with the goal of reunifying the peninsula and destroying the North Korean army. On October 11th, Red China denounced the invasion of the North Koreans by UN forces and warned that it would not stand idly by, threatening to intervene if hostile forces approached the Yalu River. The 8th Army drove up Western Korea and captured Pyongyang, North Korea's capital, on October 19, 1950. Truman was concerned about China entering the war. MacArthur had assured him that they would not dare in the war and that it would be over by Christmas. On November 20th, UN troops reached the Yalu River on the border of Manchuria. But the entry of Chinese Communist forces with 250,000 volunteers into the war on November 25, 1950, pushed UN and U.S. forces into a retreat. On December 29, 1950, MacArthur called for an invasion, desiring retaliation for the humiliating entrance of China into the Korean struggle. And the invasion of China called, is calling for by an attack by Formosa on the mainland China, a blockade of the entire Chinese coast, and bombing bridges over the Yalu River and Chinese bases in Manchuria. This he was refused. By January 1951, the UN forces began their counterattack. Germany began negotiations with North Korea to end the fighting with the pre-war 38th parallels boundary between the two nations. Truman was reluctant to expand the war in Asia for several reasons. 
First, the uncertainty of what the Soviets would do. The perception the Soviets were a greater enemy to Europe than China to Asia. The realization that it was a UN action, and several UN members did not want a global war. In fact, that other allies faced problems elsewhere, France and Indochina, Britain and Malaya, communist activities in the Philippines, and India's struggle over Tibet. MacArthur, however, ignored Truman's attempts to negotiate peace and told China to either make peace or risk attack by UN forces, arguing to Congress that there is no substitute for victory, and openly criticizing the president. Truman removed the widely popular MacArthur from command for insubordination and replaced him with General Matthew B. Ridgway, who was more loyal to Truman in his objectives. Armistice negotiations at Khe Sang continued two years without progress. In the United States presidential election in 1952, Eisenhower promised to go to the peace talks personally, if elected, to get them moving again. And from December 2nd to the 5th, 1952, Eisenhower visited the peace talks, as promised. It is unclear if his action aided the end of the war, because the talks continued for six months before the armistice was finished. Eisenhower had threatened to use nuclear weapons. Then Joseph Stalin, on March 5, 1953, died. More than likely, Stalin's death left North Korea uncertain about the future Soviet backing. A breakthrough at the peace talks occurred three weeks later. On July 27, 1953, an armistice was signed by the United Nations, Communist China, and North Korea, which established a demilitarized zone along the 38th parallel. On January 19, 1954, the United States approved a U.S.-South Korean mutual defense treaty. Korea conflict again reinforced with the U.S. State Department that containment was the correct response to Soviet-backed communist aggression. The cost of the war, U.S. casualties included 33,629 dead, from battle and 21,617 from other causes. 103,492 were wounded and 7,955 were missing in action. The Koreans and Chinese suffered over 1 million casualties. Another Red Scare. The Korean War exacerbated the anti-communist fears in the American public. To prevent communist invasion of key government positions, Truman established procedures to keep them out of office, including the loyalty order, an executive order that required all two million federal government employees to pass background checks that verify that they were not communists or associated with other groups that sought to undermine the government. Those communists who were or had been in office were tried and dismissed from work of the over three million employees. However, only 378 were noted as concerns. When he became president, Eisenhower revoked the order. The House Committee of Un-American Activities Congressional Committee from 1938 to 1975 that first inspected, investigated suspected Nazi and communist sympathizers. HUAC investigated the Hollywood movie industry based on allegations that the IS industry contained many communists. Ten witnesses, who became known as the Hollywood Ten, refused to testify, arguing that the investigation violated their First Amendment rights. They are banned from the movie industry and given prison sentences because HUAC considered them to have shown contempt of Congress. Fear of Communism in 1948, the Justice Department indicated that the leaders of the American Communist Party are consisting to overthrow the U.S. government. Alger Hiss had held important State Department positions and was accused by former communist Whitaker Chambers as being a communist. Congressman Richard Nixon became involved and eventually Hiss was convicted of perjury. Evidence indicated Hiss did pass information to the Soviets from the mid-1930s to 1945. The major importance of Alger's case was that the people began to place more importance on Hiss as a symbol than as an alleged spy, and by then it was too late to prosecute Hiss or espionage. Atomic Spying On September 23, 1949, the USSR exploded their first atomic bomb. 
experts would say it would take three to five years. British physicist Klaus Fuchs admitted to giving the USSR info on the A-bomb. The Rosenbergs were implicated. They pledged a fifth and said they were being prosecuted for being Jewish. Jewish Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, former communists, and Klaus Fuchs, a German-born English nuclear physicist, were convicted of spying and secretly passing information about the atomic bomb to the Soviet Union. The Rosenbergs were sentenced to death, making them the first Americans to be executed by the United States for spying. When the Soviet Union, their archives indicated when they fell, that Julius Rosenberg was indeed guilty for passing the secrets. His wife, Ethel? Not too sure. McCarthy's Witch Hunt. On February 9, 1950, Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin said he had a list of 205 communists in the State Department. They had infiltrated the State Department to shape American foreign policy. In subsequent days, the number changed. A particularly suspicious aspect of McCarthy's accusations regarding the State Department was that he constantly changed the number of people he was accusing. Over the next few years, McCarthy continued making charges that were unsubstantiated. Over 150 investigations resulted in character assassinations, blacklistings at universities for professors in certain businesses and within several professional organizations and the entertainment business. McCarthy's accusations reached absurdity when he claimed that communist agents included Secretary of State George C. Marshall. You know, the guy that came up with the Marshall Plan to save Western Europe from communism, the United States Army. McCarthy stated the Army was promoting communists within its officer corps, but the public found this very too hard to believe, because the military was a different kind of institution in the public mind. And they just got finished fighting the Korean War, stopping the spread of communism. From April 22nd to June 17th, televised committee hearings allowed Americans for the first time to see McCarthy in action, and he became a casualty of the new medium of television, as it was clear that he was an alcoholic. His flimsy evidence, intimidation of witnesses, arrogance and contempt for others, and manipulation of statistical data brought his integrity and sobriety into question. The American public saw him as a bully and a liar. The emptiness of McCarthy's charges were revealed when Joseph Welch testified at the Army McCarthy hearings. McCarthy lost support among Republicans and lost control of his Senate committee, and was censored by a Senate resolution 67 to 22. On December 2nd, after a Senate committee led by Arthur B. Watkins condemned many of his practices, the results of McCarthyism. American playwright Arthur Miller would pen The Crucible about the Salem witch trials, making it similar to what was going on under McCarthy. The McLaren Acts. Congress passed the McLaren Acts, International Security Act, over Truman's veto in 1950. This act required communist organizations to register with the Justice Department, barred immigration by those who were members of the totalitarian parties, and called for communists to be put in concentration camps in case of national emergencies. The McLaren Walter Act, the Immigration Nationality Act of 1952, played a similar fears. It renewed the national origins quota system established by the Immigration Act of 1924 and favored immigrants from Northern and Western European countries. Conclusion. The Red Scare in part grew out of the tensions of the transition from the Second World War to the Cold War. America was still grappling with its role in the world, especially in relationships to totalitarian regimes. The Red Scare violated the civil liberties of many innocent Americans shaped immigration policy and painted any questioning of the government as unpatriotic and un-American. After the Great War, the United States had emerged as a world power. The nation's role in the Second World War secured its position as a global leader. If it is the international conditions that set the stage for a Cold War, 
the actions of political leaders and thinkers set the events in motion. The United States' increased role on a world stage was evidenced by the growth of new bureaucratic and highly secreted government agencies such as the NSC, NSA, and the CIA. The role of the executive branch and the size of the federal government also increased. Truman attempted to carry on the New Deal policies that he thought would help bring the United States out of the Great Depression. He inherited the presidency in difficulty times and viewed himself as doing his best in the circumstances he had. Many critics, but a number of historians have recently reevaluated his effectiveness as president in this period of transition.